pandemonium reigns. All right, boys. Here we go. Aggies. Neyland Stadium. CBS. 3.30. Checker Neyland. Orange on white. Traditional uniforms. No smoky grays, but we are a checker in Neyland. We seem to be doing pretty well in this uh, CBS 3.30 time slot, but... Uh, a lot has changed since the last time we were in one of these spots. Nonetheless, thanks for hanging out with us to talk about it. I'm Dan. He's Mike. This is Pandemonium Reigns. Appreciate you so much for uh, hanging out with us in this Orange Cast edition to talk Aggies and Vols. And listen, man, I'm nervous. Yeah, I got some nerves. Um, I got some nerves. I'm going to be watching this game from a campsite, uh, you know, internet service, phone service willing. Um, mm -hmm. If not, I'll be posting up somewhere, um, you know, somewhere in Chattanooga to watch this game. So, mm -hmm. yeah, a uh, little nervous. Uh, the Aggies, you know, I, I think a lot of strengths of both teams cancel out the, the strength of the others and some of the weaknesses are the same as well. And, and we're about to dive right into it, but yeah. the nerves are there. I wish, I wish I was going to be there is what I wish. Oh yeah. Me too. Me too. So, so let's, let's, let's talk about that without talking X's and O's and Jimmy's and Joe's and all that first. Let's talk about this whole narrative that is Tennessee's good at home, right? A&M is not good on okay. the road. You, yeah. You, you're, uh, our podcast listeners will definitely not be able to see that smirk you were just giving me just then. I'm, yeah, well, well, I'm going to go another direction at the end of this if you're, if that's what we're starting at. So let's talk you know, about that. Do you know the actual numbers of our current streak at home and how well they are not on the road? Do you know what those numbers are? Uh, I know that we're we're currently running on our longest home winning streak since 2000. That ran from approximately 1996 to 2000. Uh, so Peyton and T. Martin, the end of Peyton, the end of T. Martin, uh, I think it's at 15 games. Might be 14, could be off a little bit, but I know it was Georgia 2021 last time we lost there. Impressive number, right? Very, very impressive number. Question, though, for you and for all of All Nation, would you be saying the same thing? Yeah, that's an impressive number if Butch Jones was the head coach and he was throwing, at you, throwing that at your face. Uh, it depends on how, you know, if he touted it the way he touted everything else, I'd be rolling my eyes out of my head. But Hopple's not mentioning it. You know what I mean? He's not selling the program in press conferences that way. Uh, he's obviously selling it to recruits, and the staff is doing the same thing because we're turning the ears of, you know, more and more four- and five-star prospects. We're, we're in their ears. We're getting further into the process. We're landing the guys, let's be honest. Yeah. Uh, um. So I, I like that Hopple does it that way, you know, I know that you've got to do that sometimes. I, I know that recruiting is literally nonstop. It is literally everything you do is recruiting. But I, I think it was more Butch, you know, I need to be here. I deserve to be here. Don't fire me. Those type things is what it was from Butch. And I'd probably be rolling my eyes out of my head. Finding any kind of positive light he could, right? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, this one, so on paper, this will be – the biggest challenge we've we've we faced thus far, which if you look at it through that lens, should not give you a lot of confidence considering we were significantly better on paper uh, against Florida, but you know here we are sitting at four and one. You could look at it this way and you could say, well, Texas A&M, they've got two losses. <clears throat> they they allowed Jalen Milrow to beat them through the air, and they allowed a a weird, unpredictable Miami team. You know, to get the best of them, but I'm going to take X A and M's defense there and say I'm not so so sure they knew who they were at that point in time of the season. Uh, they seem to be a little uh, heavier on the pass rush, pass rush and blitz. Several I watched. I've gone back and watched the highlights a couple of times to try to prepare myself for this one and watch that A and M and Miami. Uh, that Miami uh, A&M game, gosh, lost my words there. And <clears throat> what I discovered is A&M, so many snaps, only brought three. Really? To rush Tyler Van Dyke. Only, and he just had all kinds of time. That's interesting because that means they, they got – okay, so let me – I was going to mention, and everybody should have heard this by now, but A&M is Tyler Van Dyke and Jalen Milrose, only 300-yard performance 
through six, five, six weeks of the season. They're their only 300 yard performances. So it's interesting to me that Van Dyke and Miami did it with AM dropping eight, dropping, dropping nine if they're only yeah. rushing three. Yeah. Um, because the flip side was very, very evident. And they often, I think, I think I heard a number that it was like 70% of Milrose dropbacks he was blitzed. Um, I, of course, I didn't track that in real time. I was really just, I mean, it was a heavyweight battle for like three and a half quarters before A and M kind of said, "We're still Alabama. You're still you're still coached by a Saban assistant, and this is usually what happens in these games." At that point, you know, about three and a half quarters ends when that happened, uh, and it was the most odd timing as well because it really it really flipped after A and M picked off Milro. Mm. Uh, Bama turns around and picks uh, Max Johnson right back off. I think they go down. I think they throw that long touchdown at that point. One of their their couple. Mm-hmm. Um, and the game flips in a really odd time when Texas A and M should have had ultimate momentum and had a chance to go up by two scores. Not the case, obviously. Um, and again, just very interesting to me that those guys had their best performance with A and M doing different things. Yeah, yeah. Not a good sign I, for not a good sign for them. I'm not right. saying that will be the reason or the outcome. You know, obviously yeah. Milton needs to have a good game and should have a good game, arguably. But you know, that's what we'll see on Saturday. Boy, do I have some numbers for you regarding Milton. Okay. Can't wait to get to that part. So, but back to the original conversation. I, I just, I just believe that A and M is operating under a different philosophy than they were against uh, Miami at that time. And and again, transitive property is just not a thing in this sport. Well, this team did this team against it's against these guys, so we should. Yeah, that's just not how this works. Um, their their front, the deep their defensive front really concerns me. Uh, and we are very reliant on on the run. Uh, and so that that's that is a concern that I have right now. Um, the absence of Brew McCoy is a concern that I have. Uh, Joe Milton is is a concern that I have. I am operating under the um comfort that Cooper Mays is back. And so we'll 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 hopefully see a better offensive performance on on our end but man on paper these guys are they got dudes everywhere oh, yeah. dudes oh, everywhere yeah. uh i do think that their secondary is a little sus you know 100%. a little suspicious but you know i want to look at some we're going to be heavy statistics this episode so i'm going to look at some s- statistics and um not many are going to favor us fair that's fair so uh let's actually get into that a little bit Let's get into that a little bit. So let's look at the defensive side of things. And obviously I've just grabbed all of this all of um off of ESPN. So defense points allowed per game. This is where we're better. Uh 17.8 for Tennessee, 19.8 for AM. Rushing yards allowed per game. We're sitting at 115 yards allowed per game. Are you looking at this as well? You're looking down at something like, okay. Just got it. Just got over to it. Yep. There you go. There you go. And AM allowing 84. I believe that number is going to be a little bit skewed out of this, uh, especially coming out of this Alabama game because they they bas- basically said, if you're going to beat us, it's going to be because Milrow is going to throw it. And yeah. that's what they did. So they now have to tip their cap. And Alabama just didn't run well. Um, part of that's going to be because that number is skewed due to hitting Milrow in the backfield and you know and and collecting those sacks. But still, eighty four yeah, uh, yards allowed per game. That's a that's a number I would love to have. Uh, yeah. p- passing yards allowed per game. We're sitting at one hundred ninety two. They're sitting at one hundred eighty four. So not much that favors us right there. And that points allowed per game really similar in the seventeen and the nineteen. And you could you could argue you could argue that they've played a better schedule. Oh, they no, they no. You can't. They have absolutely played a better schedule. Fair enough. You can't argue that. So yeah. Fair enough. Well, which is what I was going to say. So let me hit the pause button on this real quick. We were talking about the home streak and how <clears throat> they're not very good on the road. This is really going to be their first true road test. I mean, you played Arkansas on neutral turf. Yes, you played at Miami, but Miami just doesn't. That's not an intimidating environment. Right. No. I mean, you, you you can you can basically hear all the coaches in their headsets and Coral Gables. So that's irrelevant. So one thing I do like about this, um, that's what I wanted to say is uh, some positivity I have is how are they going to handle Neyland's pressure? Because yeah. I expect Neyland to be crazy. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah offenses. Um, oh, unless you want to go ahead. Yep, yep. I was I was just going to say you're correct that the 84 uh, rush yards allowed per game for A&M is skewed. 
even and of course this was this was week two. This was game two, A and M in Miami. But you have Henry Parrish Jr. He averaged five per carry. Uh, the next guy in line, AJ Allen, averaged four point four per carry. You even look at Jace McClellan, and his number wasn't great, three point eight per, per carry. Roy Dell Williams is really the more telling one because I think there's obvious implications that he could be more explosive than Jace McClellan in the open field. But Alabama really kept it inside the tackles more so than they tried to get outside or anything like that. I was just going to say you're correct. It's it's a little bit of a skewed number, but it's obviously sure. impressive because they had something like 15 tackles for loss against Auburn. So, yeah. I mean, it goes both ways. It, it skews in both directions, if you will. Yeah, I mean, it, it's similar to saying, well, you know, the offensive numbers for, for, for schools like Ole Miss and LSU is a little school uh, skewed because of the, the outcome that they just had. But are you going to penalize them for, for that? I mean, no, no you're not. No, you're not. And you can't do it in this case either. Exactly. So offensively, um, yards per game, we're, we, we've got more on them, 466 to their 420. Points per game, we got one more on them, 36.2 to their 35 and a half. We are out rushing them. This is where I like this. Rushing yards per game, we're putting up 231. They've got 144 per game. And then just total. Total points on the year, we've got 181. They have 213. Okay. And then we've got a total of 1,156 rushing yards on the year. They have 869. So okay. if stats are indicative of anything, what that means is we've got to put the ball on the ground and be successful at it. Uh, this, this, this continued narrative for us of, Four yards per carry between six yards per carry, and and, I'm, and it, if if it's not a, a long run in garbage time from you know a Cameron Seldon because we're down you know whatever amount or up if or up yeah whatever um, if that number is around five and a half by the time the clock strikes zero I I feel pretty good about yeah. the outcome of this game yeah and I would stretch that down into the high fours uh, just because as much as I think we obviously our, our, our success on the ground has been really eye opening because the success through the air is not what it was before. It's, it's not carried over from 2021 or 2022. It's mm-hmm. somewhere in the middle um, of the worst and the best moments. Obviously it's not the, the worst Milton's been, and he's certainly not been as clean as he was uh, in moments last year. So yeah. I think you can stretch that down a little bit and Tennessee have a favorable result, you know, and, and as long as you're not consistently facing second and 12, third and nine, right. anything after that, obviously, I think that's much more important than, you know, getting, uh, you know, I'm not going to say they've got to hit 5.5. As long as you're not consistently and, and look, Milton is going to take some sacks. Any, any quarterback that Tennessee lines up Saturday afternoon is going to take some sacks. That's how good this front is. I'm obviously uh, still in the mode from the last solo that I did that I'm going to give the benefit of the doubt to the offensive line with Cooper Mays back. But I think you could have last year's offensive line and the quarterback is going to take some sacks because I think this is, this is right up there for the best front, you know, Alabama, Georgia. It's, it's right there. I agree with you. I agree with you. Yeah. You're the, especially with the front. Um, okay. So I was going to wait to go here, but uh, you, you really, you basically just underhanded softball pitch this to me. Um, uh, here's where I'm going to get really number heavy. Okay. All right. Um, so all this comes from pro football focus. I may or may have not have created an account. Hey, may or may have not have. All right. So I want to start with Max Johnson real quick. Sure. Uh, and the reason that I want to get to this is because we're talking about Tennessee's – actually, I'll start with Joe. The reason I want to do this is because we're talking about Tennessee's running game and can it be successful or not. And I think the – more than any game that we've played thus far, the deep ball will have a significant impact. I don't know that it's had an, an impact – uh, like it has before, basically being a part of the narrative or the formula in order to win a game as much as it will this one because of how good AM is at defending the run. All right. Uh these these stats that I'm gonna throw at you, bro, are gonna they're gonna make your stomach crawl. Okay. Make your stomach crawl. All right. So here we go. Um <clears throat> behind the line of scrimmage, Joe Milton. He is 47 for 52. So this is this is a pass thrown. 
behind and thrown and caught behind the line of scrimmage. 47 for 52. He's 90% behind the line of scrimmage. He's got 376 yards and two touchdowns behind the line of scrimmage. 90%. I feel really good about that. Awesome. Uh, short, short yards, zero to nine yards. He is 35 for 44. He's 80%. All right, so he's gone down 10%. 331 yards, one score. Here's where it starts to tank. Tank. Yeah. Intermediate throws, 10 to 19 yards. 11 for 27. 11 for 27. He is 40%, 137 yards, three scores, no picks. Okay. Yep. Here's where here's where it tanks again. You you probably if you didn't know the number exactly you're you probably already knew this was coming. I mean we just have it connected on the deep ball. We just haven't let, done it. Let me guess. Let, let me guess. Seriously. Let okay. Me guess. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, actually, what's the what's the yardage range again? Twenty plus. Twenty plus. We have completed no more than six passes of twenty plus. We've completed. We've completed more than six. Okay, that's surprising. I couldn't tell you the attempts. I know they're way, way under what they were at this point last year, but I'm surprised it's over six. So, go ahead. He is eight for 30. Eight for 30. On 20-plus yard balls. Eight for 30. That's 26.7 completion percentage. That that's is disgusting. terrible. That's disgusting. Terrible. He's got 316 yards. He's got three scores, but that's where all three of his picks on the season come from. Yeah. So he goes from 90% to 80% to 40% to 26%. It just it just drops. Now, this game's not played on paper. Right. It's it's not played on paper. You know, I I do trust Hypel enough to be able to dial up certain things against certain defenses. I I think that I think that he's going to throw certain things at uh an AM that he wouldn't throw at an Alabama. I I mean, so this is not stone, right? It's obviously ink and paper. At the end of the day, it doesn't mean much because you really just never know until you take the field, right? Yep. But here's where it gets worse. <laughs> here's where it gets worse. Uh I found I found uh, Max Johnson's numbers as well. Behind the line of scrimmage, he's seven for 10, 31 yards and a pick. I like that. Yeah. I like that. Seven completions. You only found 30 yards. All right, cool. I'll take that. And I like that. You, and, and I like that you found a pick behind the line of scrimmage. Yeah. Uh, from zero to nine yards, you're 30 for 37. He takes a significant jump right there. He's got 336 yards, two scores and a pick. From 10 to 19, he's seven for 13. Seven for 13, 53%, 109 yards, one touchdown. 20 plus. This guy, he just gets better. At, at the, the, the farther the ball is thrown, the better he is. All right. 20 plus. He's seven for 14, 50%, 199 yards, four touchdowns, no picks. So Pro Football Focus does this thing where you've got these elite gradings and the grading scale is very funky. Your your average grading is somewhere between like a 60 and a 69. Your elite yeah. grading falls under 90 to 99. On his 20 plus, he's grading out at a 96. At a 96. Wow. Joe might be grading out at a 7. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, just like his jersey number. So, yeah. That's a bunch yeah. of stats that I wanted to throw at you. I got more coming later, but if we're playing this on paper, man, I'm 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 scared to death. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. If you play it on paper, it looks almost as much of a loss based on those numbers as Florida looked like a win. The thing that I like is again, they're secondary. And I think what you need to do at all times is you need you I don't think there ever needs to be a situation where Spurl White and Ramel Keaton are lined up on the same side of the field because okay. you've obviously got Josh DeBerry, the transfer from Boston College, who just got – man, if you want to talk about PFF grades, his might have been in the negatives out of yeah. that Alabama game. Talking about Jermaine Burton, Isaiah Bond, those guys breaking out, Milrow breaking out. Whoever you can get on that guy, sure there's going to be a safety on that side if they're smart. Mm -hmm. Don't ever let both Squirrel and Ramel be lined up on the same side. Obviously, mm -hmm. Squirrel's going to do some motion things. He might do some jet things. 
you know, some some pop pass type things, whatever. But don't ever run a true pass play with those guys on the same lot, side of the field. Mm. That way you're getting a buffer as well for the new guy that steps into the wide receiver. I'm not calling Brew wide receiver three. Obviously the new guy is wide receiver three. He's yeah. going to get a buffer and he's going to have the benefit of a lightning fast guy on his side of the field or a pretty surgical route runner on his side of the field, Ramel Keaton, as long as he can, you know, eventually make his way back to something more like 2022 form. And again, you need to pick on Josh DeBerry. You should have 15 targets going at whoever he's guarding, I think. A minimum of 15. That is your recipe for winning this game. The other thing that I the thing that I think Tennessee has to avoid is we've seen a and we just talked about it, AM rushing three, rushing four. Uh, and we've seen them blitzing the pants off of Milrow and getting roasted both ways. What you can't mm. have happen is them run, you know, rushing four, rushing five, nothing exotic, nothing uber conservative, just playing average defense with their two high safeties or whatever that Tennessee's seen majority of the time. You can't have them shutting you down doing the average thing. If they're going to stop you, if they're going to consistently stop you, it's got to be something out of left field. They're dropping too many guys. They've got everybody covered. The offensive line breaks down after a couple seconds of, you know, everybody trying to get open or they're bringing so many. We can't find a way to block them. We can't hit a quick pass, those type of things. Don't let them play their average game and, you know, completely stifle everything that you're trying to do. So what do you think the formula is for them? Oh, like, like overall. And what I mean by that is when we were going into, I I hate that we keep bringing up Florida, but going into Florida, we're saying here, here's the recipe for Florida. It's super simple. Um, they need to they need to put long drives together. They need to utilize their 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 very good run game. They need to to find ways to get short intermediate passes for completions to to, to just move the chains. And they did that really really well. Um, what what's the formula like that for a And M? You think for for their offense, it's tougher because they don't they either don't rely on the run game that way or they they can't do it. You know, we've talked about as well on this on our podcast. How some teams, and I think Tennessee falls into this category this year. We'll see, you know, we'll we'll see. But some teams are better pass pro. Some teams are better run blocking. We've talked about that on here before. I think it's evident that not all blocking schemes, not all offensive linemen are created equal. Just because you can create a hole in a defensive line and, and make a you know a lane for a guy to run through, doesn't mean that you can hold up for your quarterback for two or three seconds or X number of seconds. Mm-hmm. I think the formula. For for Texas A&M defensively is to to see what see what their base defense gets them early in the game. You're rushing four. You've got two high safeties. You're not allowing the bomb over the top. See if that works. If not, adjust accordingly. I think for them, they're going to be allowed to drop guys in this game because I don't think it's great when Joe has to find a guy amongst eight nine defenders or you know linebackers in the secondary drop back. I think that's their formula for success. Mm. It'll just but if they do that. You know, you know that we're going to hand the ball off every time. So there's, there's yeah. obviously, you know, two sides of that sword, just like everything else. But what I was getting out of before was their offense. They don't rely on the run game, or they, they just don't do it well. To me, you, you can't really change my mind of that based on their offensive numbers. It's, it's looked very similar, maybe one step worse, going from Wigman to Max Johnson. There's not been a crazy drop off. He's probably not quite as good, or his ceiling's a little lower. But I think they're going to do try to do what Florida did in those type of drives, passing ball with crossing routes. They're going to bring, I think his name's Jake Johnson, uh, Max's brother, mm-hmm. uh, across the field like they did against Alabama with success. Yep. They're going to bring. They found Evan a score Stewart. off of it. Exactly. Yeah, they're going to bring Evan Stewart probably running posts and, and crosses, and they're probably going to have a nice Smith doing the short stuff. Obviously, he can take the lid off, but he's also very dynamic with the ball in his hand. So I think he's mm-hmm. your. You're more short guy. Let him do stuff after the catch is, is probably what their game plan will be. Mm-hmm. We'll just have to see what what Tennessee defense we get. Uh, we obviously, I, I think it's that I don't I don't know of another game on the schedule, maybe Kentucky, where stopping the run will be this important because they already passed the ball well, uh, or they prefer that. Like I'm like I've been saying, mm-hmm. you can't allow them to open up their run game in in a game like this if you want to win. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, let's let's shift to the other side then. What would you say the formula is for us to pull out a win like this? And you might have already, you know, answered that by answering, you know, what we said about AM, but I'll start that off by saying 
I think you need to find deep balls, and I think you need to find them early. Uh, I'm not talking yeah. third and fourth quarter. I think you need to find them early. You, I think you need to do that just simply where you can where you can push the safeties, or at least make the safeties throughout the rest of the course of the game respected or anticipate it coming at any point in time. And if you can do that, I like the numbers game inside the box. If I like the numbers game inside the box, I like our ability to run. Yeah. I completely agree. A deep ball early would go it would go a lot longer than three or seven points on that drive. I think it would it would really back them up. It would really put the fear of Joe's arm in their head, what what he can do with it if he's on, of course. Uh, but yeah, I'm I'm finding again, whoever whoever DeBerry has, if, if it's Ramel, I want one of Ramel's, you know, double move looking routes where he just ties the guy up and we're just gonna throw it up to him. It's a 50-50 ball if it has to be. And we're just going to mm-hmm. try to see if we can take advantage of it. If it's squirrel, I feel even better because of his speed. Uh, he may not be the again the the surgeon that that Ramel has been route running at times, but I'm telling you, man, I'm taking a shot. If again, 50-50 yeah. ball at worst, play for pi if you got to do whatever you got to do to back those safeties up early. Sure. Um, and again, I'm I'm really I'm rooting for Texas A&M to go the Miami route, drop guys because. If we get to like 160 rush yards, we don't lose. That's that's a stat all of its own, not for this game. Yeah. But our, our magic number is like 160. So I think if you drop back, we're going to run on you. You can't tell me we're not. If, you, if you're rushing three, four guys, if you're not blissing us heavy, uh, especially, especially if we try to take it outside and we're not worried about having to beat Walter Nolan and those big, big dudes on the inside every single time mm-hmm. for a handful of yards. If, if we're trying to get it outside – if we're getting Joe involved, whatever it takes to to get the run game going, and if if they if they're going to bring the the pressure game that they played against Alabama, it's going to have to be on Joe Milton's arm. Agreed. Not on the run game. I don't see them sitting back though. I don't see them rushing three constantly. I think that would be it, foolish. I think that'd be foolish because we are. Uh, I'm going to have to see more out of this offensive line with Cooper Mays in it because I've seen too much of this offensive line without Cooper Mays, and I don't like it altogether. I feel better about it, obviously, with the addition of Cooper. But with that being the case, like – and 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 you know what? If I'm an Aggie fan, I'm like, Joe Milton's not proved anything, man. Like, go get him. Like, hit him. Yeah. He's he's susceptible to injury. You know, he's, he's only got five sacks on the year. He's only taken five sacks on the year. Why? Because we go quick. We go fast. Uh, a lot of that was slowed down with him. Um, and I'm going to, I'm, I haven't, I, I've not done the back work, but I'm going to be, I'll bet that all five of those sacks came when we slowed it down. Probably so. I would be shocked if, you know, three of them weren't against Florida at the way that game felt. Yeah. You know, yeah. with it being only five, I mean, they probably didn't have that many. Uh, I think this is, a, this is a huge, huge game for the tight ends as well. Obviously, they're going to be so important. The, the backs are going to be important in pass blocking scenarios for the backs and run blocking scenarios for the tight ends. But if you can leak Jacob Warren up the seam like like he's done mm. before, yeah. or if you can get him you know, wheeling out like we've seen him do as well, uh, he looks a little bit more dynamic catching the ball this year. Um, I know he's he's been in college forever, but what can you get out of him? If you can get McCallan Castles coming across the middle and get Joe to deliver one at, to him accurately – and get McCallan to bring it in, something he's not done all that great this year. Never a better moment than this game to put something new on film and mm-hmm. to find success in another way. Yeah, put something new on film, especially with uh, the road trip to Alabama next week. And and just the stretch that we're facing. Yeah, yeah. I think I'm also going to feel pretty good if, if, if we're sharing touches in the backfield. Obviously, that yeah. is a, a very – uh, I'm not. I'm not saying anything profound here, but if we're looking at 15 touches for Jalen, you know, 12 to 15 for Jabari, and Dylan is sitting anywhere between seven to 10, feeling pretty good, you know, about our situation. I think that means we found some running success because, as every Tennessee fan in this world knows, <clears throat> Dylan Sampson didn't see the field in Gainesville, Florida. So we you, definitely you, want definitely want the ball. In the stands. If we're down by 10 points in the third quarter. If the game is a constant rock fight, whatever the scenario is, he needs six to eight touches minimum, uh, Dylan Sampson. Yeah. And and what I would really, really, really love for us to break out because it's been so not a part of the game plan in this era is get him in the game, get him some some passing targets, 
not on the swing pass, though. You know, give me a screen. Give me more of the shovel action that we've seen. Give him something breaking over the middle, an angle route. I don't care. Get him some, you know, if, if half of his touches are passing targets, great. I think he's such a weapon. Even if we're down, even if we need the backs in pass pro, he's got to be in the game because he's such a threat to, I mean, he's, he's got a gear that obviously Jabari doesn't have probably mm-hmm. a little faster than Jalen. It's right there, I would say, neck and neck. Mm-hmm. He's, he's got to get touches in this game. I don't care if you're yes. losing. I don't care if they're, they're murdering Joe in the backfield. You got to get the ball to him. Agreed. Who do you think needs to step up inside the receiver room? Like, I mean, we know it's got to be somebody. It's got to be yeah. somebody. Um, well, and we don't know the status of Thornton. So, so who's it going to be? I'm not putting any stock in Thornton until I see reason to going forward. Uh, for one, right now, I'm afraid that the hamstring is going to hurt his case to really do much. You just for, don't come back other. from a hamstring. It's so tough. Uh, you know, it, it really hurts a receiver, especially, obviously. Uh, for the, for another thing, he's not lived up to the hop that he that he brought in before that. So I'm looking at Ramel Keaton, and I would like to. Here, here's what I would like to happen: is I'd love for it to be Caleb Webb on the outside. I just think he's got such a ridiculous catch radius. We've seen him make circus catches, even if it's in a spring game or whatever, where the ball just drops in from outer space. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, I, I've got no problem with Nimrod. I don't. Uh, they also seem like they really want to use him on the outside. Mm-hmm. And we've seen Webb be on the inside more so. That mm-hmm. could be the difference in their body types or whatever. But I'm rooting for Caleb Webb because I think there's going to be some serious need for, for a little 50-50 ball action here. And obviously, mm-hmm. if, if Squirrel's in the game, and he's going to have to be in the game for Tennessee to have success or you know to win the game, pretty much Squirrel's got to be in there. So you're not putting Squirrel on the outside. So if, if it's Nimrod because he's played on the outside more so, time to step up, buddy. Uh, but of the veterans, I'm looking at I'm looking at Ramel because even in the South Carolina game, I think Sproul had nine or ten catches. So he's yeah. he's he's pretty well holding up his part uh, when he gets his opportunities. And I'm I'm looking at Ramel to break out of any funk that that remains in 2023 and and really get it going. Squirrel White, correct me if I'm wrong. Was it not the opening drive of the South Carolina game where they we we ran some odd motion with him and gave him some sort of jet sweep or? Or, or a quick toss, uh, then we didn't see anything like that uh, for the rest of the game. Maybe it's because it didn't go as well, but I believe he picked up four, five, or six. Um, you know, with with their abilities and their talents up front, wouldn't hate to see a little bit more of that. Yeah, give me. You know, if Jalen's in the game, give me him lining up in the slot, motioning in some type of read, whether it's a veer or uh, just a, a plain old read option run a, sw- or a speed option off of it, I don't care. I think yeah. everything has got to go much more so to the boundary than it has down, you know, mainstream I-75, middle of the field <laughs> so far in our in our season. Yeah. I just yeah. don't think there's going to be much success against the size of that interior defensive line. No, I agree with you. I agree with you. I want to swap things over to the UT defense against the Aggie offense. But before I do, we need to tell you about our friends over – uh, at North Forsyth Training and Fitness, brand new sponsor of Pandemonium Reigns, located at 4015 Browns Bridge Road in the coming area. If you're in the coming area, ready to change your life physically or looking for a new gym, North Forsyth Training and Fitness is going to be your place. Owner and head coach Jesse Foster has all the credentials and the experience to help you reach your goals. With morning classes that run as early as 5.30, 7.30, 9 a.m., afternoon, 3.30, 4.30, 5.30, and 6.30, there's surely a class to fit your schedule. North Forsyth Training Fitness, it is a community-driven gym, so you not only achieve your goals, but you do it together with a group of people that you get to call friends. So what you need to do right now is contact Jesse Foster today and come check out what North Forsyth Training and Fitness is all about. His number, 706-633-6609. Again, that's 706-633-6609. North Forsyth Training and Fitness in Cumming, Georgia. Go up, pull up to Jesse Foster and tell him the boys at Pandemonium Reigns sent you. I appreciate our new sponsors, one of more to come. So cool. All right, so let's talk UT defense. And I want to begin by asking you, how do you feel about the UT front against their offensive front? I like that matchup. I think both defensive lines are, are, I mean, they really have a chance to excel in this game. We saw 
Alabama putting immense pressure on Max Johnson. Now, the one thing that I'll say that scares me is until later on in that game, he would stand in there and take a body blow and deliver an accurate football. Now, it may not have been caught every time, but he was putting it in the vicinity of his guy, the spot, the hits that he was taking. Uh, He took five sacks on the day. I think Tennessee Mm -hmm. has to get at least three. Uh, no, no less than three, in my opinion. If if I think there's one that if they don't get at least three sacks, I'd say they they win this game. Now we saw Alabama lose every. Whoa, 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 category. whoa, whoa, whoa! If we don't get three sacks, we lose this game. We have to pressure him. We cannot. It, it's I think it's it's like we talked about a little bit with South Carolina. If they're gonna get theirs, it cannot be us sitting back. You know, we force them into third and ten. They pick up twelve. It cannot be that Florida game last year that we've talked about with Anthony Richardson throwing it to Pearsall oh, gosh. or a tight end or whoever right at the sticks, extending plays because he can also do that. He's he's not going to kill you with his legs, but he is going to he's going to move around the pocket. He's going to step up if he can. He's going to sidestep you if he has to. He's he's good enough to do those things. But what I would what what I need from Tennessee's defense, first two or three drives, and I don't care if you get beat for an absolute bomb. Because you gave up, a, you, you blew a coverage. I want you blitzing. I need five and six guys sent every other play on the first couple drives. I need mm-hmm. Max Johnson thinking that he's still at Kyle Field last week. He's still getting, ber- you know, berated by Alabama's defense. He's going to take hits. His eyes are going to be the size of the, you know, a full moon. That's what I need. I need for him to be in the mindset that it's last week on repeat. They they obviously forced immense pressure on him later in that game. So. If it's something where you know they're getting close, they're not quite getting home. Just make sure you get there later in the game. Uh, obviously, I think that's only going to give yourself a better chance of forcing a turnover. And I do think that battle cannot be lost as it was against South Carolina. You cannot lose the turnover battle and win this game. I don't think uh, because again, I'm just terrified of their interior defensive line. Being honest, um, but again, I think both defensive lines are going to win the day. They're going to beat the offensive line that they're facing. Uh, so it'll be about which offensive line can do the better job. Um, and then again, I think you need, I think you need at least three sacks. I mean, if, it's one thing if you're getting a lot of pressures and not getting sacks because he's obviously going to be putting the ball at greater greater risk. But three sacks, and I'm feeling a whole lot better. Well, the opportunity is going to be there because we're, I mean, we're home, and you know the crowd's going to play a factor. We're so. at home, Texas A&M. Excuse me. No Jimbo Fisher coach team has defeated a ranked opponent on the road since 2016. Uh, Gary Danielson gave the re- gave the crowd a whole nother reason to get loud, which we'll talk about towards the end. Um, can't believe the words that came out of his mouth. And again, we'll get there. But it, you said this earlier as well in the, in the podcast. I mean, first true road game for them. You know, like you said about Arkansas, neutral side. Miami, well, when they get home field advantage back, it'll be the first time in a long time. They've, they've not seen this environment, and they're going to be hostile. So Jimbo Fisher, since 2016, has not won a top 25 road game? Top 25 road game. That is correct. Well, we can't speak any more of this because we know how this goes. Like, we talk about these things going into the game right before kickoff. CBS is talking about it, yada, 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 and then streaks are broken. 100%. All right, so you're talking about pressure, pressure. I don't know that I agree entirely. I don't know that I agree entirely. But I, I, I said that for Florida. I said that for South Carolina. Just I, because AM's defense is significantly better than uh, the Gators and Gamecocks, um, I think now is the time for the secondary. It's your past due. You have got to get to the place as a unit where you can show one thing, and as soon as that ball is snapped, you flash into another. You show cover two, you flash into cover three. You show man, you drop into cover four. We've got to start doing this stuff. We've we've got to – I like Max Johnson as a quarterback. I mean, their, their quarterback situation is so much like the way that I felt as a Tennessee fan 2022 – like, listen, obviously Hooker is the guy. Obviously, Wagman's the guy. But feel pretty good about the backup situation. Worst case scenario. All right, worst case scenario for them, Max Johnson, who's been a starter in this league. 
if if fans are looking at this and going, oh, well, he's the backup. He didn't win the job. Well, then you better have that same logic for Joe Milton. I, you better have the same logic. So, uh, again, he's been a start in this league. He's done it at LSU. Uh, he throws one of the prettiest deep balls I think you're going to find, and that's the stuff that scares me, right? Um, yeah. If, if I'm looking going into this Florida game, I'm like, dude, let them get the chunk plays because the sooner they get in the end zone, the sooner we get our offense back on the field. That means the defense is off the field and they can't play keep away. Mm-hmm. I don't expect that to unfold the same way. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm going to put I'm gonna put a lot on the secondary here and say you, you, you better up your game because this is going to be uh, arguably, man, at the time, Spencer Rattler. Arguably, best quarterback you faced thus far. Now, Graham Hurts had a night, but he he was it was one to one to ten yards where he lived. Yeah. Um, this guy, he can do it. He can, he can do it all, and he's not a statue. He he no. he can do just enough. Uh, if you'll pay attention to him, um, he's not going to throw it away. He's going to see what he can get with his legs. He's going to see if he can get three or four. Uh, that's his, that's his want. That's his desire. Uh, so there's, there's several things. If you're just, well, he's Max Johnson. What kind of white boy name? You, you better stop. Um, I've, I've had three people this week say, who's Max Johnson? Well, you, you, if you don't know that, I don't know that I really respect your opinion. And I probably shouldn't have said that because those guys are listeners. Sorry, y'all. Um, so no, all I'm saying is secondary, don't let this, narrative continue of you just continuing to suck i <laughs> turn a freaking page man uh now i do think there's going to be the time and the place to come after him i, I think you got to be really balanced in your approach to max johnson uh so what that means and what that involves what you have to do is when the ball is put in the air you have to defend it well if it is caught you better be draped all over him, not in a pass interference type manner, uh, but make it a tough, tough throw and catch situation. I like our defensive front, I like these guys. Um, you know, like your, I, I love what you said about <clears throat> both defensive lines are going to get theirs. Um, we better get ours. This three sack number, I think I agree with that. My heart wants more. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, my I'll body five. My body. I mean, what? I mean, so there's a there's a conversation there too, though. Is is the Alabama front better than ours? Here, here's I mean, what I would say to it. I would say that there's, you know, it's beefier. It's probably bigger in the interior. Like we, like I keep talking about for for this specific episode in this matchup. I think it's bigger in terms of talent and beef in the interior defensive line. But it's it's not quite what it's been on the outside. I mean, yeah, you've got Dallas Turner. You've got, I believe it's Deontay Lawson from the other side. But, I mean, the sample size for A&M facing strong defensive lines is really Alabama. Now, I know that they had issues against Miami, but that's been weeks ago, weeks and weeks ago now. Mm -hmm. Um, Let's let's put it this way. I mean, their quarterback got injured. You know, their starter did get injured. You know, their offensive line – I don't you know. Did they allow that to happen? Do they allow them to take a lot of hits? That was against Auburn. I do think ours is better than Auburn's. Um, yeah. I don't think ours is better than Alabama's. But yeah, I absolutely want more. And I think it's it's not the South Carolina game, but there's an opportunity to do a lot of things and, yeah. and really get at this guy. Agreed. You know, I, there's got to be a reason that he didn't win the job, right? So, I mean, we looked at the numbers earlier in the podcast. There's 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 a lot to like about him. There's a lot to like about him. So why didn't he win the job in the beginning? Is it because, and I'm hoping that, you know, in the run game, does he get them out of the right or out of the wrong plays into the right one? Does, does Wagman do that better? You know, um, it's, it, can he make the better checks at the line of scrimmage? Is that, or, or can't, uh, is that why he didn't win the job? I mean, cause again, once the ball is snapped, a lot of reason to like him, a lot of reason to like him. So I'm hoping it's the pre-snap stuff where Wagman was just better, if that makes yeah. sense. You know, getting them in and out of the right checks. <clears throat> All right. Um, anything else on the defensive front before I shift gears here a little bit? Nothing on the defensive front. I've heard people say that he holds on to the ball a little bit too long. In my limited time of watching him this year, I've not necessarily seen that when he's had time. You know what I mean? If he's got four guys, guys in his face automatically, who's going to do well with that? But I've not necessarily seen him hold on to it too long. 
Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm curious as well. What's what one would win the job? I I'm gonna feel really good if 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 he tries that. If he tries to hold on to me it. too, me too. Because because I, I like our defensive front. Okay, so if you don't have anything else, speaking of our defensive front, it's time we start putting James Pierce Jr. more into our conversation. Okay, a hundred percent. I I have a conversation, and this is not even really on the topic of the A and M game. Now it's going to play a card here, but James Pierce Jr. He's at five sacks on the year. Okay, with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven games to go. So I started asking myself, can this guy break some records? Can he break some single season sack records? Uh, so just to kind of remind everybody where we're at as, as a school, your career leader in sacks is going to be Derek Barnett, 33 total career sacks. Reggie White right behind him with 32. Then you get down down to the list and you've got um, your 10 spot is available. It's available. Yeah. 20. It's oh, available. Yeah. It's available. Yeah, now, it I if, if Pierce – continues in this trajectory that I think he is on, we might not have him past the 24 season. Oh, no. It's it's heading that way uh, because of his position as an edge rusher, because of his freaking length. I mean, he's 6'5". He is fast. He's explosive. He lined up on a slot receiver at one point against South Carolina, came flying inside, and I think he got a sack. He definitely got a hit on that play. Yeah. It's yeah. not trending. It's trending the Derek Barnett route in the sense that you're not going to have him for four years. Uh, it's not. It's a little late because he is a sophomore, and next year could be his last. Right. For him right. to probably get to that top spot, if right. he's not at twenty by the time his career ends, I'd be shocked. Sure. Well, I, I don't know that a, a career number is in the cards, but I do think a single season number is in the cards because when I'm you start you. looking at single season, your record holder at the one spot is Reggie White with fifteen in a single Ooh. season. Yeah, buddy. But your nine and ten spot, it's also available. That's held by Derek Barnett with ten. Yeah, and ten. Look, he's he's got he's averaging one per game so far. He obviously he's had two. He he had two against South Carolina. It's obviously not played out exactly that way. But right. he's averaging right at ten, right yes. at twelve. And the ones the games he didn't get sacks, he got he got the pressure was there. Yes, and and can we just can we just really ask ourselves if there's if there's moments in competitive games that he's not on the field. Why? Why would yeah. it be why would it be yeah. anyone else? Now look, yeah. if it's late in the game, I absolutely want Joshua Josephs getting those opportunities because I think he's a young pup with some yeah. serious, serious potential as well. I mean he's got a similar build. His arms look like pythons. Um you know what I mean? He he's he's got that build. He looks like a dog. Yeah. But uh yeah, I mean if it's not <clears throat> if it's not Pierce in a high pressure moment, what what are we doing? Yeah, no kidding, no kidding. So let me let me start diving through this a little bit. So there is a possibility for him to to get on the top ten board in the single season record because it's it's your top number is fifteen, your bottom number is ten at the ten spot. All right, so I went through, got my sheet here, and I looked at the remaining schedule and those quarterbacks and how many times they've been sacked and what games. So Ooh. I'm looking forward to this very quickly. A&M is next, all right? So Wagman, before he was hurt, he was sacked three times, okay? Once by Auburn, once by UO, uh, University of Louisiana Monroe, and once by University of New Mexico, okay? Okay. Not very good teams overall. Three sacks. Johnson, less playing time, more sacks. He's got He's been sacked eight times on the year, five by Bama, so that's going to be your difference maker right there. He was sacked by Auburn. He was sacked by Louisiana Monroe. He was sacked by New Mexico. So the probability for James Pierce Jr. getting one there, just one, it's there. Oh, it's it there. looks good. It it's looks there. Good. And then you go to Bama, where Milrow has been sacked 21 times on the year. Six by AM, four by Mississippi State, four by Ole Miss five by Texas, and two by the Blue Raiders of Middle Tennessee State University. Milrow has been sacked in every game that he has played in, every one of them. You're going, wait a second, uh, their record does is not indicative of, um, there, there's, there's something wrong there. You're thinking of South Florida, where Ty Simpson played. He was sacked five times. Woof. Woof. 
five times. So the probability for Pierce to get one against Bama, you got to like that. Oh, yeah. To get him on that left tackle every single snap. So now if he can get one and one in each, he's now at seven. Now you look at Kentucky, Devin Leary. He's been sacked seven times on the year. Three by Georgia, once by Vandy, once by Akron, once by Eastern Kentucky. I got to believe that if those guys can get to him, we can too. He's been sacked in every game but the Florida game, and we all know how bad they wet the bed. I and like that, the – And that he had 16 pass attempts in that game. Yes, yes. So I like the probability of James Pierce getting to Devin Leary once. I'm going to put him at eight. <laughs> and you get to yep. UConn. UConn homecoming. Taquan Robertson. Robertson is your quarterback. He was sacked by Utah State, twice by Duke, and once by Florida International. I like the odds. I'm going to put him Same. at nine. I'm going to put him at nine. Then you go Missouri. Brady Cook, 11 times on the year. Two by LSU. Two by Memphis. Two by K-State. Four by MTSU. Once by South Dakota State. Brady Cook has been sacked in every game but Vanderbilt. Unbelievable. I like the odds. Give me a sack there. I'll put him at nine. Here's the, here's the place where I don't necessarily like it. Georgia. Beck's only been sacked three times on the year. Two by South Carolina, one by UAB. He has not been sacked. U, uh, UT Martin didn't get him. Ball State didn't get him. Auburn didn't get him. Kentucky didn't get him. Okay, so I will leave one off there for the sake of being realistic. Yeah. AJ Swan, Vanderbilt. <laughs> That'll be the last game. AJ Swan thus far has been sacked nine times on the year. Once by Kentucky, two by UNLV, two by Wake Forest, once by Alabama a and Woof. And three by the Rainbow Warriors of Hawaii. I looked that up and I was like, wait a second, those numbers don't line up either. Oh, that's because Ken Seals has also gotten some time and snaps at quarterback. He's been sacked four times on the year, two, twice by Florida, once by Missouri, once by UNLV. I like Pierce's odds to get home against a Vanderbilt quarterback. I don't care whose name they are, right? That would put him at 10. Yep. And and look, Tennessee's not probably – it's it's not over yet. This game is – this game is wildly important if you if you would like to repeat in a New Year's Six Bowl. Your yeah. your SEC East chase is mm-hmm. over if you lose. And obviously, you know, no one is expecting the playoff. But again, two losses are out. It's that simple. Again, our thoughts are not that they're going to go that far. The players' thoughts is that they are. I was going to say Tennessee's probably not going to play a team as good as Clemson's been in a bowl game. So you got to like his chances depending yeah. on the bowl, uh, the bowl opponent. The opportunity to tap into the top 10 for the single season is there. It is there. It is there. It is there. It is there. Um, All right. So let's get into the uh, finals for previews and predictions, picking the outcome of this uh, Aggies and volunteers. And it's making me sick. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do it. I don't want to pick it. No. Well, I don't. I'll, I'll take the I'll, do, I'll take the honors. I'll give you the first prediction. I'll Can I throw something at you before you do? I Please stalled do. way too much. You're good. I want, to th- I want trivia, trivia for you. All, all right. right. So uh, we're back on the set conversation just for a minute. Sorry, listeners, we're all over the place. Told you the career. Told you the single season. I want to talk single game just for a second. The single game record is five. Ooh. Can you tell me who it was? No, I cannot. I mean, I would guess – my guesses would be Reggie White, Derek no. Barnett. Albert no. Hainsworth would be no. a guess. Probably not because he's interior. No. no. I, I, Kurt Majit lived in the backfield a time or two when he shifted outside. Uh, He did live in the backfield, but it's not Kurt Majit. I figured it wasn't. Uh, I got No, I got nothing else. No other names you want to throw at me? I'm sorry, I don't. I'm probably blanking on on something right in front of me, but I don't have it. <laughs> All right. Uh, so third place is is going to be 2018 against Kentucky. Dar- uh, Darrell Taylor. Darrell that's going to that's going to that's going to be third place. Second place is Reggie White with four 1983 against the Citadel. Your top person, five sacks. I'm gonna give you a hint. The year was 2013. 2013. 2013. 
I got nothing, dude. I got Corey nothing. Corey Miller. Corey, Corey Miller. Miller had five against Kentucky in 2013. My goodness. My goodness. Wild. Wild. All right, Absolutely lead us off. Wild. Lead us off. Previews okay. and predictions. All right. I've got Tennessee covering a three-point current sit, currently sitting at three points. They're going to cover that. Tennessee's going to win maybe the first game of Josh Hopple's career where he didn't score 30, and I think they're going to do it 27 to 19. A very, 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 very similar game to what AM just played against Alabama. I think the the road factor and the noise that they haven't faced this to, to this point so far are are going to be exposed. I like the Petrino Fisher quarterback, you name it, relationship less and less as losses mount. They're only at two, obviously. I like it less when the pressure's there, though. Um, but home field. I, I'm about to tell you why Gary Danielson, in a moment after your prediction, gave the, gave the fans any fuel that they would have needed. Um, I, I think it's going to be too much. I like Tennessee to get it done. Hopple is is proving that he wins these type of games. I mm-hmm. think if it comes down to coaching, that Tennessee has mm-hmm. the the advantage. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to ride with my guys, 27 to 19, hitting the under as well of of 55. So what's the narrative out of a 27 19 outcome? Texas A&M just couldn't find points they could move they could move the ball but they couldn't find the end zone like i think it's i think it's largely you know potentially a continuation of what it's been this year that the defense has has taken clear strides uh you know didn't have a great night in gainesville but they've they've taken strides had a great night against south carolina they've looked better in in moments where they would have given up points and yards and everything to to lower level teams before um but the that the offense is is capable of doing enough to win games uh, in situations like that. I don't think it's going to be anything spectacular, but we've seen business top wins before. I think that's the category it would fall under if it was 27 to 19. Okay. You know, that's going to be a heck of a narrative if 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 Heupel can score less than 30 and find a win, a, a premier win like this. I mean, It's yes, got to happen at some point, right? Yeah. Yes, it's an unranked Aggies, but, you know, it's, it's still a loaded Texas A&M Aggie, uh, uh, this was tough for me. This is probably the hardest prediction I feel like I've had to make so far on the year, and I absolutely whiffed against Florida. Didn't we all? I'm going to say 31-27 balls. Okay. So I had a – Taking the over. I had a really hard time uh, – I yeah, I'm taking the over. I had a really hard time – in my mind, AM overcoming the road win narrative. Now I won't be surprised. Man, I sure won't be surprised if, if they find a way to do it. And fair. Oh, you know, and I, I could just see it now. Gary Daniels, it's it's loading in. You hear the, the boom, da, 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 da. welcome to Knoxville, Tennessee, Neyland Stadium. Jimbo Fisher hasn't won a premier road game against a top 25 opponent since 2016. <laughs> Right, and then they'll say it again at the yep. end once it's all over. Fisher finds a way. I, I could just see it now, man. I'm, I've got I've got battered ball syndrome. I've got it. You do, you um, do. But you know what? I like Hopple. I just like Hopple. I believe in him. Um, I read a lot of statistics to make you believe that there's so many reasons that Tennessee can't get it done. Um, but I also think that A and M has been just as undesirable as we have at times right uh, completely so agree if this game is vice versa as far as location goes oh, i'm going to get word. i'm going to say 3127 them i'm going to i'm going to flip flop it i think i think mm-hmm. and i hope that the stadium has an impact uh, i hope it gets dark i hope that clouds cover the moon right and milton throws one over the moon uh to uh, they call Crescent Moon, he fulfills that touchdown Tennessee. Nonetheless, I'm rambling at this point. I, it was just uh, truth be told, it was just really hard to find a landing spot, and it was so much about what I feel because I don't know. I mean, we haven't seen a run defense like this. We haven't seen a roster like this. You could argue, you could argue, this is our first test because South Carolina, large in part. Mm, did we impact them? Did they have a bad night? I mean, 
I'm not going to say either way. I, I I would be I would be okay with an argument that says they were off or whatever. I'm fine with that. I think they're so handicapped by their offensive line that that we just took advantage of it. Sure, and and you could say as as many Tennessee fans have, like you would have liked to see more yards and points be, because of that. So, who who is better in significant moments? I'm gonna pray and hope it's the home team. Thirty-one set twenty-seven volunteers. Hundred percent. We've talked, we've previewed this. Just want to highlight Gary Danielson's comments, and it blows my mind to hear to to think. You know, it's it's hard to like this guy for a lot of people. I'm definitely one of them. Um, but here's this guy coming in to call this game his hundredth CBS three thirty kickoff at Tennessee mm, in the yeah. This will probably be the last one. You know, unless Tennessee really really cruises into the Georgia game with one two losses, that one could be a three thirty time slot. This could be the last one. Okay, and, yeah. and Gary Danielson's words leading into that was, I don't know if it makes any difference if there's eighty thousand loud people or a hundred thousand loud people. Uh, further on down, uh, Tennessee doesn't take a backseat to anybody, but to me, it's just about the same as other SEC stadiums. This is as simple for me as if he had said, it's just about the same as LSU at night or Bama in the Iron Bowl or Auburn at any point in time. You know, if he had said something like that, I'm probably okay. This is the man that called the 2022 third Saturday in October. He Mm -hmm. was there. Yeah. He's been there a hundred times probably saw the best version that it's ever been or that it's been a long dang time last year against Alabama. And I understand that he's probably got the same, you know, level of crowd volume in his ear, whatever sound piece he's using. I, I'm, I'm sure it's the same, but if you're so naive as to think that all of these venues are created equal, <laughs> I got nothing for you. And I think this is a minor thing that I think the fans are just going to be sitting there waiting to explode. The fans know how important this game is. They they should know that A and M uh, has not had many road tests, like we've talked about at length on this podcast. But yeah, it just blows my mind for a guy that that has no self awareness to me in his last season in the SEC to say something like this in what could be the last trip there. All right. Well, let me ask you this um, because I don't I don't want to stir your pot on Gary Danielson anymore. Mm-mm-mm. I will say this though: he's seen more Tennessee losses in that stadium than he's seen wins. And that's fair, but it should have it should have been changing to me the last couple of years, the product that he's seen there. I mean, knowing what it's capable of doing, that's that's a that's a, a but but I'm biased. I'm biased. Oh yeah. Uh I agree with you though, in totality. <clears throat> Is this a must win? It's it I saw a perfect I wish I could give credit to who who I saw this from within Ball Twitter. I just I didn't save it, therefore I forgot it. But I saw a perfect description for this game. It's not a must win. Apple's seat is pretty dang secure. Cool. Entering, yeah. 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 2024 doesn't matter really, as long as you don't completely wet the bed in this tough stretch that's coming. Good to great coaches win this game because of the coaching advantage that you have, because of the home field advantage that you have, because you're going to find matchups like I think Josh DeBerry is covering anyone is. And and look, there's sec- I've, I've picked on Josh DeBerry a lot. Other teams have done the same on the field. <laughs> their secondary as a whole has not been good. Uh, and it doesn't make sense when their their defensive front, especially their line, and the aggression that they bring sometimes with, with blitzing other guys is so good for their secondary to not be better. That makes no sense to me. Mm-hmm. It makes no sense when you're bringing in the recruits that they have since NIL started that you wouldn't address the secondary. It just it doesn't add up. And, yeah. and good coaches, great coaches take advantage of that. Look at the job we saw Saban do. And, and Milrow's been terribly bad at times. He's thrown beautiful deep balls at other times. He's taken losses. He's taken a beating. And he breaks out for 320-plus in at Kyle Field. Mm. Yeah. And I'm, yeah. Not comparing, I'm not comparing anyone to Saban because he's in a special category. But, but that's what good coaches do. That's a fair argument. I think it all comes down to how you define must win and what that means Agreed. exactly. I think if you're saying if this is a must win to reach to reach nine and three, yes, then it's a must win. Um, yep. Eight and four will still be on the table. I don't know that I like the odds for eight and four if you lose this game. I think you could be staring at a seven five, just to be totally truthful, uh, you because you, you still got Alabama on the road. You still got Kentucky on the road. You're going to host Georgia. I don't that that game could be played on the moon. I, I'm not optimistic about that one right now. Um, 
what am I missing? Mizzou. Mizzou on the road is not going to be like it has been. I'll I'll word it that way. So uh, m- must win for nine wins, ten wins. Yes, must win yeah. to keep Hypel's job. I mean, I think that's a an ar- a relevant question. I do think there's a ton of value on this game and and the kind of trajectory because we've talked about this stupid narrative, right? With with Jimbo Fisher and on the road and stuff, and I mean. Th- that's going to be thrown in our face, and don't tell me that the players won't see it, right? So, is it a must win? It's a must win in the sense of if you want to hit nine and three, yes, it's a must win. It's a must win in the sense of do you want to get on the right trajectory, not stay on to get on? I don't think we're. I still. I feel like we're still in this gray area. I'm not. I'm not even convinced entirely who we are, and we've played five games. So you want to get on the right trajectory? Better win this game. Hundred percent. That's 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 where I'm standing as well. Well, I hope we get a 27-19 dub or a 31-27 dub. I hope that the offense puts it together. I hope we get three sacks. Man, I, I hope for all the things. I would I would love to just run them out of the building if I'm totally truthful. I don't I, I still have little to zero respect for Jimbo Fisher and not a lot of respect for Bobby Petrino either. But, you know, this is the world that we live in where dirty people get really big paying jobs. <clears throat> yep, and, and we're due for that type of breakout in 2023. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Where we, where we, uh, an, an LSU 2022 win is what you're getting at? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, yep. yeah. I agree to that. Well, we have gone stupid long in this episode, so we thank you so much for hanging out with us. Thank you to our sponsors. Appreciate you hitting like and subscribe. Make sure you're telling everybody that you know about us over at Pandemonium Reigns. Appreciate you letting us tickle your ears. We love you guys. We hope you have a fantastic college football Saturday. Here's to hoping the Vols win by 50. God bless. Go Vols. Give me up.